Hello, everyone. Welcome. Research America is bringing you a special holiday treat today, a fireside chat with Bill Novelli and Frank Sesno. If you've always wanted to participate in a master class in advocacy, you've come to the right place today. Bill Novelli and Frank Sisto, two extraordinary communicators. They will highlight strategies that can overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles. We all know something about those these days and achieve major policy, advocacy and business objectives. I've known Bill Novelli for quite some time and can say that his wit and wisdom and creativity are second to none. Bill's the founder of the Business for Impact program at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. He's also the former CEO of AARP, the founder and chair of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and co-founder of Porter Novelli the award-winning communications firm. Bill's an emeritus member of the Research America Board of Directors. Our masterful interviewer for today's discussion is the Emmy Award-winning journalist, Frank Sesno. Frank is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. Frank has more than 30 years of experience reporting from around the world and is well known as bureau chief, anchor, White House correspondent, and talk show host on CNN. Today's discussion will highlight some of Bill's insights and communication strategies that he's written about in his forthcoming book, Good Business, The Talk, Fight, Win Way to Change the World. Frank and Bill, I'm sure, will also offer some tips and stories that they've picked up along the way in their distinguished careers. You can type in your questions in the Q&A box at any time. My colleague, Terry Schwartzbeck, Schwartzbeck, along with Frank, will handle those during the Q&A time. And with that, Frank, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for everything that you do, for your wonderful words of welcome, and for all that Research America stands for and advocates for. And Bill Novelli, it's great to see you. Thank you, Frank. It's great to see you too. You have written this book. I have a bootleg copy of the book, Good <laughs> Business, the Talk, Fight, Win Way to Change the World. It seems incredibly relevant now, given the world we're in and with this audience so interested in science and other things. Um, I think it's an incredibly relevant conversation because you are probably the most purposeful person we could imagine. And that's what you've written about here. What inspired you to, to write this book? What story are you trying to tell? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Frank. Um, first, I want to thank Mary. and I want to thank Research America, her whole team. It's a, it's a wonderful organization and it does things, which of course is what you and I are going to be talking about. Right. Um, you know, I've had a long career. I spent about half my career in corporate America and about half in the nonprofit world. And I had a little stint in government as well. So I've had a pretty good run. And what, I, what I've discovered is that no matter where you work or who you are or what you do, you can make a difference. Uh, you can make a little dent in the universe. You can really make things work. Um, and that's the reason behind the book. I really believe that firmly. And I think we can all, all make a difference. Bill, you start your book um, in the start of your career. <laughs> Uh, explaining that you were in sales. And as you write, when it rained, I sudsed. <laughs> you want to explain what, what the origins of your career really were all about? Yeah. Well, my first job was with Unilever. And I wanted to go to New York and I wanted to be a hotshot brand manager, advertising guy. Um, and the first thing they teach you is humility. Uh, so I got about a week's worth of training and a sales bag. And I was sent to the um, to the rural areas of upstate New York. Uh, and I had two suits. Uh, and I worked the aisles and I worked, uh, you know, warehouses and so forth. And our mainstay product line was laundry detergents. And I'd get these detergents into my pockets and my cuffs and everything else. And then when it rained, as you said, I would suds. <laughs> so literally you would suds. I would literally suds, yeah. 
And um, so, you know, that's, Frank, that's, um, that's called working retail. <laughs> and no matter what we do in life, you've done it, I've done it, everybody does it. You know, you really have to get down where things are, where things are real, whether it's in a hospital, whether it's in a warehouse, uh, whether in, in your job, uh, you know, um, on the scene, uh, that's how we learn things. And, and uh, so you learn humility at first uh, and you learn really uh, what customers and clients and the real world is about. Um, you learn humility, but you had taken with you, uh, I think, a sense of purpose that sort of pervaded you and, and obviously has shaped your incredible trajectory since. And it's something we'll be talking about in some depth here. But perhaps you could explain to people how, you know, that day in the New York Times, you saw something about the Peace Corps that became an inflection point for you. Yeah, that was a big day in my life. Um, I, I was at Unilever and I was um, a product manager, a brand manager. I was doing well. Um, and in those days, uh, the idea was you had to work both sides of the street, uh, the client side like Unilever and then the advertising agency side. So I went to, uh, I went to a really hot New York ad agency and in both cases, I was doing well, and I was basically marketing packaged goods. But I, I had a problem, Frank, and my problem was I wasn't finding social relevance in what I was doing. And I, and I, I was vaguely uh, aware about it and troubled by it. And then one day, I opened the New York Times, and there was a story about the Peace Corps and how the Peace Corps wanted to reposition itself. And it wanted to attract more older volunteers, more uh, people who understood agriculture, more nurses, more MBAs, and especially more people who looked like the people in the host countries where the Peace Corps worked. And I thought, wow, marketing the Peace Corps. I want to do that. So I applied for the job and through good luck, good fortune, whatever you want to call it, I got it. So I went from marketing laundry detergents and kids cereals to marketing the Peace Corps. You didn't suds anymore after you made the move? <laughs> well, I did go, I did take long trips into Africa and other places as part of the Peace Corps, and I didn't suds, but I saw the real world. Your work in the Peace Corps when you went to Porter Novelli and you started that business, the campaign for tobacco-free kids, your work at ARP, all have what you write about here at their core, which is purposeful work. And Bill, I, I'm, I'm thinking of people who are, who are joining this conversation now, many of them in the sciences, many of them in research, they, they are driven by purposeful work. But purposeful work seems that it's gotten so much harder because evidence-based thinking has been under attack. We're in such a more polarized population. You are a survivor veteran victor in, in, in Washington. What how, what do you counsel in terms of purposeful work given the environment that we're in now? I think you're right, Frank. I think things have gotten tougher um, for a whole variety of reasons. I mean, we are really uh, a divided country, but um, I don't think it needs to get in our way. In fact, I think it's a reason why uh, we need more purpose. So, you know, I work with MBAs. You teach at George Washington. I'm at Georgetown. Um, what these young people say is, uh, that they want purpose as well as a paycheck. Mm -hmm. I think that's so powerful. We see that in survey after survey, Gen Z millennials in particular, that seems to be a substantial change. I, I think it is. I think it is. Um, and um, they want more than that. I mean, they want, um, they want the opportunity to make a difference. So they want to go to organizations that understand that purpose is important, that you can do well by doing good. Um, and companies are figuring that out. Companies understand that if they want to attract this talent, they need to basically figure out how to apply purpose to their work. So in the, in the book, Bill, you stress talking and fighting as a way to achieve social impact, right? What do you mean by that, talking and fighting? Again, in the, in the world that we're in now, there seems to be a lot of talking and a lot of fighting. So what exactly are you saying? Yeah, what I'm saying is that... Um, the, the social and environmental problems that we have today are so big and so tough that we just can't have endless combat. We need, we need everybody at the table. Um, and you know, Frank, you've seen this in your own lifetime. Uh, Tuesday's opponents are, could be Thursday's allies. And so if you're a company and you say, um, you know, I don't want to deal with a bunch of tree huggers, 
and you're on the nonprofit side and you say, oh, these companies are the problem, they're not solutions. Uh, we've got to get past that. We've got to get everybody at the table and we've got to talk. But of course, you have to fight as well. And I've done a lot of fighting, whether it's the tobacco industry or many other industries. Um, and, and my answer to it all is, if we can talk as well as fight, we can win. You've been called a few names along the way that you write about in the book. Nancy Pelosi had a nice term for you. Uh, I, was it Mitch McConnell had a nice term for you? Uh, so it's not without scars that you're going to do this talking and fighting. That's right. That's right. You know, I have developed some scar tissue. I, I will admit that. Uh, somebody said to me who read the book, um, gee, you, you sound tough. Are you tough? And I said, well, I'm a sissy when I go to the dentist. Uh, <laughs> But I, I, I don't think it's so much uh, toughness as just, um, uh, you know, the courage of your convictions. I'll put it that way. So Nancy Pelosi uh, did call me a name. She called me a Republican. <laughs> Shame on you. Mitch McConnell, you can imagine, called me a Democrat. Shame on you. And there was a certain senator at the time who called me a communist. Uh, and I consider all those badges of honor. And the way I think about it, Frank, is that, um, you know, most Americans are not on the extremes, the extreme right or the extreme left. Most of people, including, including me, are in the pragmatic center. They want to see change. They want to see improvements. They want to see senators and, and congressmen crossing the aisle and talking to each other. But, Bill, let me, let me drill down on this with you for a minute, and because I think this is of great interest to many people, but especially uh, a number of people who are watching this conversation right now because they are perhaps in the advocacy business, they may be going to the Hill themselves. You know, Nancy Pelosi, call, Pelosi called you a Democrat, McConnell called, or, 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 or Republican, McConnell Democrat, even communist. That's tamed by a lot of the invective that pollutes our discourse now. Yeah. Certainly over my career covering story. I mean, I remember when Ronald Reagan said, you know, in, in, he over, always wore his jacket in the Oval Office. And he said, you know, when you remember when he was in Hollywood, when you never heard a hell or a damn. <laughs> and now think about what it is. Yeah. So what is your advice to people who are going to talk and fight, who are going to be called names, and now maybe names and worse threatened in social media, to maintain, to keep that conversation going, despite all the, the nastiness? Well, it's, it's not easy. Um, and, and you've got to be able to get past all the invective, all that stuff that you're talking about. You know, Reagan said something else too. Reagan said, government is the problem. Government is not the problem. Um, you know, we've got to get everybody together. We've got to get the, uh, the private sector, the public sector, civil society, all of us together. And you've got to have enough courage basically to get past the names, the sticks and stones. You know, one of the toughest um, negotiations I've ever been through in my life is negotiating with the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, you can, you, can make, uh, you can make change. Let me ask you about that. You know, in Porter Novelli, you dealt with high blood pressure and cancer and more infant mortality campaigns. Um, you went to be CEO at CARE. We all know what CARE is and what it does in the tobacco campaign, ARP, which is healthcare and all that. What's the most difficult, and maybe you already touched on it, most difficult and most meaningful, purposeful work that you've taken on that you look to now with pride? Oh my gosh. Um, uh, I think the most difficult of all was tobacco. And we've made enormous progress there, but of course we're not out of the woods. Now we've got vaping to contend with. Uh, we've got the tobacco industry trying to invent new technologies to keep people smoking. Um, you know, you can never let your guard down, Frank. I mean, that's one of the things we have to learn. Um, I would say that that's something I'm proud of, that we've driven down tobacco use in this country. And we've also worked around the world to try to make a difference. Um, there's one area right now that I'm working on that I, I think is so important, and it's with Research America. And that is to try to get the, the new administration and the Congress to increase the leadership and the coordination and the investment in science and technology. If we can do that, we can make a big difference. While you're doing that, and this comes back to the question I asked before, I want to ask you about advocacy, because it's what you do. It's what a lot of people um, here do. 
um, in this environment where everything is so politicized, but there's a new administration coming in, what are the three things that make for really effective advocates? Well, we talked about one of them, and that's the ability to sit down at the table with somebody you don't agree with. I'm gonna give that one uh, prime. That's, that's really critically important. And you know, you can't get, you can't get sucked into all, all this invective and all this name calling. I mean, it's so easy to do. And as you say, uh, things have gotten even more coarse than they've ever been. Um, and so we've got, to get, we've got to get past that. Number two, I would say, is uh, do your homework. You know, you can't make this stuff up. You've got to believe in the research. Uh, you've got to believe in the science. When you go to the table and put a piece of paper down and say, this is what is, um, people have to be able to depend on it. Otherwise, you will not be considered reliable. And, okay. and the third thing, I'm sorry, Frank, I was going to say the third thing is, uh, nobody can do this alone. We all need allies. And that's why partnerships are so important. And is the best advocacy bill also accompanied by a public advocacy strategy? Or is the best advocacy done sometimes or first or most behind closed doors? Oh, boy. Well, I would say that, um, the you know, these, these people we're talking about, and it's not just in the Congress, it's the politicians in Sacramento, in Albany, in Tallahassee, all of them. Um, they know that votes count. And so we need public support for the advocacy that we're recommending, for the policies that we're recommending. If they know that we've got the public behind us and we've got strong allies behind us, they're much more inclined to listen and to act. You know, there's a, you mentioned the tobacco challenge that you had, and it makes me think of an awful lot of things that we confront now. You were surrounded by disinformation, right? Right. Science was called into question. Right. It was highly politicized. There were all kinds of economic interests. What, what would you say you, you could pull from that that would be a direct application to this you know, evidence-based challenge moment that we're in right now? Well, luckily, um, tobacco is the only product or the only thing I've fought against that was addictive. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, they were they were a tough bunch. They were they were very very well funded, uh, and so forth. So um, I, I think what we have to do now is we have to think to ourselves, um, what what do we have? What can we offer? What kind of benefits? Um, and then we've got to basically be strong, be tough. You know, um, I brought up in the book uh, Olympia Snow. She is probably my favorite politician. Hmm. And Olympia Snow was, was tough. She was willing to cross the aisle. And um, she, uh, she basically said, I don't care who's yelling at me. I don't, I don't care. But one day she threw in the towel. She just said, I can't take it anymore. This Congress is dysfunctional. It's not working. Uh, and she withdrew from the Congress. She, she did not stand for reelection. And while I admire her tremendously, what I said to myself is, we can't, we can't do that. You know, we can't stand back. We've got to go forward. I want to read uh, from your book, if I may, a moment of dramatic reading and ask you about this. <laughs> You're right. We need government, and government is highlighted there. We need government to create policies and adopt and fund innovative approaches to advance economic and social progress. And all three sectors, you write, need to be in sync and work together. And I'll ask you about those sectors in a minute. That's business, the public sector and government. But today, as I mentioned, trust in American government and its capacity to deliver is at a serious low point. Again, thinking about people who are watching who will be advocates at different levels, um, how do we regain that trust? Or do we even try? Um, I, I really think we need to regain our trust in government. You is know, that John, possible? Do you believe that's possible? Well, um, it's going to be tough. You know, John McCain used to say that um, uh, trust in the Congress is down to a few friends and close relatives. Uh, so we've got we got our we've got our work cut out for us. And you know, there's a joke. You've heard it yourself. You can get a laugh anywhere in this country by saying, "I'm from the government and I'm here to help you." Um, and you'll see people who rail against the government. They say, um, you know, keep the government out of my social security. Right. Not even or Medicaid or Medicare. Yeah, or Medicare. Not even realizing it's a government program. Or people who say, um, 
you know, the best government is no government. And then they and then they have a flood in their area and they want government support. So um, what we've got to do basically is we've got to get our, our politicians to understand that when they undermine the government, they're undermining our democracy. Um, and the only way to do that, I think, is to be strong, is to work, as I said before, in partnerships, uh, to take on big issues. I mean, the biggest one I can think of right now is climate change. Right. How did we come to politicize the climate? Um, well, how do we come to politicize face masks in face the middle masks. of a pandemic? Everything. Now, now we're in danger of politicizing uh, vaccines. Um, we've got to we've got to get past that, and I think we can do it. And I think it starts uh, bottom up at the grassroots and top down by people like us going to Congress and making our case. Do you think our political divide is permanent? I don't. I don't. I'm I'm an incurable optimist. I think it's tough. We we talked about how tough it is, but you know uh, the United States has been through these periods before, and they tend to be cyclical. Um, and so far, uh, so good. I know it's tough and I know it's, it's a difficult time, but I think that if we get the leadership in place, we can make a difference. Bill, what do you think we have learned from the COVID crisis, if anything? You know, we, we, we're in this with the rest of the world, obviously. We've seen highly politicized messaging to include face masks, as we just discussed. What have we learned and how might we apply it in a positive way to your points going forward? Well, on the negative side, Frank, um, I think we've learned a lot and we've shown how really foolish we are. Uh, you know, Ben Franklin uh, once said, um, experience keeps a dear school. He meant an expensive school, but a fool will learn in no other. And that's us. We're short-sighted. We've, short we've short-changed uh, prevention and public health and science and technology all these years. And so when a crisis comes along, one that we can even foresee like a pandemic, we're not ready. Um, and so we've, we've, we've learned that the hard way. And hopefully we're gonna get a little bit more, uh, a little more farsighted as a result of this. Well, I've had the but pleasure to work with, Re with Research America as well in the past and other organizations sort of looking at how we communicate science and advocate for science without turning scientists into you know, partisan advocates, which is not part of the job description and shouldn't be. Um, but I'm wondering what, what you think and what your advice is to, to put science into the conversation. I mean, you've dealt with it in so many, in so many issues, right? And you know Washington so well. There's people who say that if you just talk facts and just talk science, you lose people. You've got you, you to connect with the narrative and whatever. And yet we need to talk about the science. How, how do you do that? And how do you think people in science should do that? Um, it's not easy to do. Um, we've done a fair amount of research in this area. And, and what we tend to see the, uh, is that, um, you know, as you said, and I said before, it's politicized. Um, there's no question about that. But I, I saw some recent research that showed that there's not much difference between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to getting the vaccination they're both moving up on the scale. Um, and so that's a good sign. Um, and what we've got to do, I think, is basically to show people how science works for them. How does science work for you? How does it work for me? And an awful lot of science, um, you know, people don't understand the scientific process. They don't understand that uh, scientists fail and that's how they learn, um, but they do know that there's a lot of research out there in terms of cancer, in terms of high blood pressure, uh, and in other areas. And what we need to do is bring science home. But I, I also want to talk about uh, the other side of the uh, pandemic. I think some good has come out of it. That's hard to say, but I think it has. Go ahead. So, um, well, um, I, I talk to a lot of corporate people and a lot of nonprofit leaders. And um, they've become kind of reflective. And what they're saying basically is we need to take care of our own. Now we see corporate layoffs like airlines and hotels and whatever, but the first thing they're saying is how do we take care of our people? And that's important. And then the second thing I hear them say is how do we take care of our communities? Um, and they're, they're talking about everything from food banks to you name it. 
And then the third thing they ask themselves quite often is, what kind of an organization do we want to be? Uh, what kind of a country do we want to be? And when you get that kind of reflection, um, I think it, we could say that's the good side of the pandemic. And it's being pushed by younger people who want to see that level of social responsibility and purpose in the places they work and the work they do. All right, I want to invite you to tell a story here. Um, and I'm going to set you up here. Uh, but I think the story that you tell from your book, which I love, uh, has a direct bearing on some of this stuff that we've been talking about in terms of healthcare and COVID vaccines and climate change um, and the science involved and, and even the larger social issues like the racial reckonings that have been racial reckoning that's been taking place in this country. Um, the question is, what do we need to know about sales and all this? This is your background. And you write a great story about a product that you pitched way back when called Spry. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had a few assumptions going on here, and I actually wonder whether that doesn't apply to some of these other things. <laughs> the spry story. Yeah. Well, um, uh, first I have to say that um, uh, Unilever had this product called Spry, and um, it's, it's long gone now, but I think people still remember Crisco, the Procter & Gamble uh, counterpart. And uh, you know what that basically is, is cooking lard. And um, I had read this book by David Ogilvy about how you really need to understand retail, as we talked about earlier. Right. So I was in my sales training program uh, at Unilever and I looked up one day and there's my sales manager. And he said, Bill, he said, we're gonna miss our numbers for the month unless we do something. And I said, well, like what? And he said, I just did it. He said, I just ordered a carload of Spry and I sent it to your customer. I said, a carload of Spry, did you tell him? He said, no, now we're gonna go tell them together. So we went into the guy's office and he was an independent um, retailer, a supermarket guy. And he would fight the independents and he would, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the chain stores. And he was, he was a very creative guy, a real self-made guy. and. Uh, uh, my, my boss said to him, Norm, we just sent you a carload of Spry. And the guy jumped out of his chair and he, and he went across the desk and he said, you blankety blanks. He said, I'm going to have you fired. Un he said, unorder that right now. Unorder that. Unorder that. <laughs> so we spent the next hour telling him uh, that a carload of Spry was in his best interest. And finally, we could see that he was cracking when he brought out the scotch. So we did had a few drinks, we talked more, we talked about how we could merchandise the spry and move it off the shelf. And we would build a giant end aisle display and so on and so forth. And finally, I, I don't know if it was fatigue or our persuasion, he said, okay. So we walked out the door and my sales manager said, you see, that's salesmanship, that's how you do it. And I said, you could never learn that from Ogilvy's book. So I read that and I thought, in your book, can't that apply? And sure enough, at the end of the book, you come around and if I can paraphrase, you pose the question, or you quote someone who poses the question, why can't you sell brotherhood like you sell, paraphrase, well, like you said, like you sell soap, I'll say like you sell spry. Yeah. Can you? Well, there are a lot of nuances of difference, but my answer is yes. Yes, we can sell brotherhood uh, and of course, I don't mean to use the word sell in a, a totally commercial way, but right. we can sell brotherhood, we can sell climate change uh, prevention, uh, we can sell respect for science and technology, we can sell all these things, and we know how to do it. And, and, and well, continue with that. How do we do it? Because you're not selling spry, there's not a commodity that you put on sale and you got a fancy display around it. Um, you have to cut through the distrust we've talked about, the polarization we've talked about. So what is your thought on that? Well, there's no easy recipe, but we've talked about it, Frank. We've talked about partnerships. Uh, we've talked about talking and fighting. We've talked about really putting public pressure on our elected officials. Uh, we've talked about being willing to go to the table uh, uh, and not get into fistfights. You know, all the things that we know how to do. It's it, This is not... Um, this doesn't require a revelation. I mean, we've got the tools to make the changes that we need and we ought to do it because we owe it to future generations. We've got a fabulous country 
and we owe it to our grandchildren. I love your optimism and I agree with you. And I know we have some very good questions that have come in from the audience. And while we're taking some of these, if you've got a question and you'd like to pose a question to Bill, please wrap away and tap away and we'll um, incorporate as many as we can, get to as many as we can. So Terry, let me come over to you for the first question. Yes, thanks so much, Frank. Uh, the first uh, first couple of questions that I've got coming in. First of all, everyone, just thank you so much for being here. Bill, um, can you say a little more uh, about the point you made about advocating for leadership coordination and resources in the new Congress and the administration? Uh, what do you mean by that? And how can people learn more? <clears throat> um, I think, uh, Terry, that we see this new uh, administration um, as a breath of fresh air. And you can be a Republican, you can be a Democrat, you can be an independent. We need change. Um, and now we have this new Biden administra administration uh, basically saying, we're gonna work on climate change, we're gonna work on science. Uh, they, they, they talk about uh, working on racial equity, all these different things. This is a tremendous opportunity. We need to talk to the transition team. This is the time to talk to Congress, especially back home. You know, don't just talk to them in Washington, talk to them back home. I come from Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, when, 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 our, when our members of Congress go back home, they ought to see what people have to say. So Bill, what, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that people should talk to their Congress, Congress members in the communities or their, their staffs or what should be happening on the ground? Well, um, we should be talking to their staffs all the time, all the time. Back home. <laughs> back home. But when a congressman or a senator is back home, and again, I go, these are, this is true of state capitals as well. Uh, when they're back home, uh, they want to hear from us. And you know that old thing, Frank, about grass tops and grass roots? You know, grass tops and grass roots is powerful. So um, at, at um, AARP, uh, we had a woman who was an advocate, a policy advocate, and she used to say, there's no better grass tops in America than physicians because they lobby you when your clothes are off. <laughs> That's grass tops. Uh, okay, Terry, I can't think of a better way to hand it back over to you for another question. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another question that's come up, you mentioned uh, the importance of bringing science home. Uh, are vaccines part of this? Will vaccines, or particularly the COVID vaccine, help people see the value of science in a new way and maybe for the better? I think the answer to that is yes. I think vac vaccines are an opportunity for us. And of course, uh, they do need to be effective. And you know, we need to worry about side effects and, and so on and so forth. But right now, the way things look, vaccines are an opportunity for us to promote science. Now, there are uh, doubters and, and people who have vaccine hesitancy and all that. We need to work on that. But um, the most important thing in my book is we need to make sure that the message sources, the people who are advocating for vaccinations are, are doing their jobs. And I don't just mean, um, you know, Vice uh, uh, President-elect uh, Biden getting a vaccination. I'm talking about the people in the community, athletes, teachers, uh, clergymen, uh, people everywhere being advocates. And they can be advocates for the vaccine and for science. Trusted messengers. Yes, you know, trusted really, messengers. Very important. Another one, Terry? Actually, this builds on that question. This uh, question comes from a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh leading a group aptly named the Influenzers. And they are an interdisciplinary group of graduate students trying to address vaccine hesitation in the Pittsburgh area. So do you have any more advice on open civil conversations with people whose views may not align with theirs? And how can we deliver that evidence-based science in this kind of climate? Well, first of all, I love that title, the influencers. That's, that's terrific. So go pit. <laughs> um, uh, here's what I say to the influencers, and they already know this, but you've got to get out into the communities. You know, go into the Hill District, talk to people there and make sure that it's not just a TV message or a newspaper message. Uh, make sure that you get into the community and have the right people, as Frank said, the trusted sources. Um, I think that's probably the most important thing they can do. And of course, uh, what they also need to do is let people know how the vaccine is working in the Pittsburgh area. Bill, 
could I could I follow up on this for a minute? And actually, I would make a connection to the tobacco campaign, which you know so well. One of the things that was so effective with the tobacco campaign, the broad tobacco campaign, anti-tobacco campaign, was the whole idea of secondhand smoke. That sure, if you want to smoke and harm yourself, that's one thing. But if you're going to exhale and harm other people who are not smokers or nearby, that's not acceptable. And that got broad by on and so, so much why we don't have cigarette smoke in public places now. Is there an application of that messaging around vaccines and COVID? I think there is. I think that's a terrific analogy. So you, you and I are old enough to remember when you could sit on an airplane and somebody was uh, two and a half feet away from you in the smoking section, blowing smoke in your face. Right. And secondhand smoke turned out to be a really good argument for us. And so I think it now applies to masks and it applies to uh, vaccinations. So what we want to say is, um, regardless of, you know, you might think it's a free country and you can do whatever you want. But think about others. Think about your family. Think about your grandparents. Put on that mask. Get your vaccine. Uh, get your vaccination. So yeah, I think that's great. Terry, got another? Well, here's another one that kind of builds on that. How do you sell things that require short-term hardship to achieve the longer-term benefit to people who are maybe are hurting? Um, we all know that the, there's been so much challenge with the uh, economic impacts of this uh, of this pandemic. Or since you're from Pittsburgh, think fracking in Pennsylvania. <laughs> no, that, that question was asked by a, a psych major, I think. Um, <laughs> we, are, we are terrible. We are terrible at um, foregoing short-term pleasure for long-term gain. Uh, even little kids, we, we know this from experience. So it's really hard to say to somebody, um, we're going to help you lose weight, but it's going to take a year. Or say to a congressman, um, we have to prepare for the next pandemic, and it's going to cost X billion dollars and it may not occur for 36 months. These are, these are hard things to sell. And um, so what we have to do is we try, try to short, make, make, the, um, uh, make the progress um, incremental uh, and say to yourself, um, if you do this, if you begin to exercise or if you begin to invest in science, we're gonna see uh, gains over time. You don't have to wait till the very end uh, for progress to be seen. Harry? So uh, switching gears a little, you mentioned that you'd spent time in both corporate and the nonprofit space. If, as we're hearing, the next four years is about building it back better, what can and should the nonprofit sector be doing if this is a theme about what government is doing? I am such a fan of the nonprofit world. Um, you know, uh, the, the thing that nonprofits have that nobody else really has is that great, powerful mission. The thing that makes you want to go up, get up and go to work every day. Uh, it's a blessing for nonprofits to have that. And I've always, uh, for all, all the different jobs that I've had that Frank talked about, you know, those nonprofit jobs are a joy. Um, I, I think that uh, the nonprofits have to really focus, uh, as I said before, on bottom up and top down. So they need to advocate, but at the same time, they need to pay attention to their service delivery. And nonprofits are going through a tough time right now because during the COVID period, uh, Donations are down for many nonprofits. I serve on several boards where we have to get out and say to people, you know, use your uh, DAF, uh, your donor advice fund, help us out. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's tough right now because we have to pay attention to fundraising while we're working on advocacy and on grassroots. Hey, Terry, I'm, I'm sort of tracking some of these questions too. And there's, a, there's one here that I am dying to ask, Bill. May I do that with your permission? Absolutely. Okay. So here's a question, Bill, for you. On those tough days when you're losing the battle, what do you do to refresh? <laughs> God knows you've taken on enough big battles. Yeah. I, I don't want to say that I'm, I'm, I'm a heavy drinker because I'm not. Uh, so what I do, Frank, is I work out. Really? Yeah, I work out. Always and, have? Uh, pardon me? Always, always have. have. I, wanted to, I wanted to play football when I was a kid. So when I was in the sixth grade, I started working out and I'm still at it. Wow. I, I guarantee that, um, you know, anybody, and you, you don't have to, uh, you know, run six miles, you can take a walk. Uh, but I, I really believe that that's a way to work off steam. I've had so many meetings where I want to, I want to punch a wall. And instead, I go home and 
punch get a bag. Get on the treadmill. <laughs> get on the treadmill. Like you need to be on the treadmill more, Bill. This is inspiring. Thanks yeah, a lot. <laughs> we should put treadmills in Congress. Terry, you got one more from the audience? Yeah, sure. Speaking of health, um, if you had five years, the questioner asks, uh, Bill, um, of time and a blank check, what health issue would you work on so that your children have, a, your grandchildren have a good life in the future? Wow. Well, we, we talked about it. Science and technology has got to be way up there. Um, I do a lot of work in, um, in advanced illness care, end of life care. And as the nation ages, that's more and more important. Um, we talked about climate action. Uh, there's nothing more important than that. And of course, science and technology makes a difference there. And then the last thing is we need to do more hiking in Montana. <laughs> Uh, two last questions, and then I'm going to turn it back over to, to Mary Woolley. Um, Bill, you have had just a remarkable career, which puts you in a position to be a, such an authoritative and inspiring voice on all of this. You've done, I mean, care and campaign for tobacco-free kids and ARP, and I mean, and, and, and the teaching that you're doing now. Is there something in your life that you wish you had done differently or you wish you had done that you didn't get to or do you feel just unbelievably accomplished and you did everything that you wanted to do? Well, you're very kind to say that. You, you know, um, uh, I think that if I had it all to do over, I could do better. I think I could do a better job. And I think Frank, and I think you'll agree with this, experience really, really matters. You know, if you've seen things a few times, um, you're better prepared to act on them. And so what I try to say to young people is um, do your best, but as you grow and as you um, gain more experience, you'll do a better job. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but the journalist in me will push back on you and challenge you and say, you've done a pretty damn good job. <laughs> Thank you. There's, you've, got a, you've got an item in your book that struck me that I'm just gonna cite here because you were talking about youth smoking. In 2000, 28% of kids were smoking. Today, six per, in 2019, which you, is the date you cite, 6%. 28 to 6, that's, a, that's astonishing. And so congratulations on everything you did to contribute to that. Frank, thank you so much. I really appreciate this, uh, this chat we've had. All right, so we end on this note and then back to Mary. You, you um, end the book with some advice to um, the next generation. Aim high, strive hard be ethical, balance personal responsibility with being, being bigger than oneself. What are you saying to, to these young people in terms of what they can do and should do and how? Well, you know, I've got a bunch of grandchildren and you gotta be careful what you say um, because they'll, they'll, they'll tune you out. So I tried to keep those lessons as brief and uh, as possible. So um, the first one, uh, aim high and strive hard. I think that's the, the, the really important one. And what I mean by that is we can all be more and we can all be better than we think. Um, and so, you know, the idea of striving means if you get knocked down, get up, keep after it. Uh, you know, don't let the grass grow under your feet. I mean, it seems simple, uh, but it's a powerful message. We raise our kids by putting bicycle helmets on and pads on their knees and elbows, but it doesn't mean you're not gonna get hurt. That's right. All right, your book is uh, Good Business, The Talk, Fight, Win Way to Change the World. Bill, it's been such a, an honor to, to talk with you here at a time when we need inspiration and motivation. You give us both, so thank you. Happy holidays to you, best for the new year. And Mary, uh, thank you for letting us have this conversation and back over to you. Oh my gosh, thank you both. Um, superb conversation. I feel inspired, including to go for a walk before it starts snowing. But more than that, you know, I just feel my advocacy commitment being regenerated and repurposed because I've been in the company, you Bill and you Frank, who are leading purposeful lives. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Um, so I, I thank you most profoundly. We look forward to your book, Bill, coming out in February. You can pre-order it now. We saw that in the chat from at least one person. Um, but I also want to say to everyone who's joined us, please have a lovely holiday. Find a way to celebrate this unique holiday and look forward 
to a healthy year ahead, because we're going to have one. Science is delivering for us. And it will continue to deliver. It will bring it home. I love your phrase, Bill. Thank you so much. Everybody have a lovely day and evening. Bye-bye.